an old saying I'm sure many of you have heard that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And our society today understands that old golden rule as it seems to be. They understand that if they want to get us to do what they are advertising, that they have to give us an image, a, a situation, a suggestion of something that we would want to emulate or to imitate. And think how many products out there are designed to make you think, oh, if I could only have that, I'd be like, and fill in the blank, the famous person that's promoting that product. If I could only wear that jacket, I would look as good as they do. If I could only have that piece of clothing, if I could only have that car, I mean, they look really good in that car, don't they? Or if I could only drive the way they drive, for us guys, right? Then we'd be good. Right? Some of us guys have tried driving that way and experienced the hard way. It's not a good idea. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But I want to suggest to you this morning that Paul gives us a great challenge in Ephesians 5. He challenges us to consider who we're going to imitate. He suggests that we should imitate God himself. Now I don't know about you, but I'm quite certain that I don't measure up in that category. I'm, I'm quite certain that uh, I don't even know, frankly, where to begin in working on myself and trying to become like God. I don't know where I have to begin in order to be as loving as He is. I don't know where I'd have to begin to be as gracious and forgiving as He is. I don't know where I'd have to begin in order to be the kind of person that others can look up to the way we look up to our Heavenly Father. God does set an example for us, doesn't He? It's an awesomely difficult example to follow. He's absolutely perfect. Anybody here absolutely perfect? Even close to absolutely perfect, other than teachers? <laughs> He's absolutely powerful. It doesn't matter how long I live waits for, I'll never be absolutely powerful. He's absolutely holy. He's absolutely compassionate. He's absolutely forgiving. And yet Paul challenges us to start with God's example and to try and walk the way he walks, to try and imitate God himself. He challenges us to do three things. To walk in love, to walk in light, and to walk in wisdom. Ben, the next slide, please. Look at it again with me, starting at verse 1. He says, therefore, and what are you supposed to do when you see the word therefore? You're supposed to ask what? What's it therefore, right? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what do we notice right off the bat? When we read this, we see that God is loving. We are beloved children. When we see the, the kids come forward, I see the smiles on the faces of the parents as they come forward and respond to the questions Debbie's asking. What do we see? We see that they're loved. We see that they're cared for. We see that, that visible sign of affection in the same way God has demonstrated His love for us in sending Jesus Christ to be our Savior and Lord. In sending Jesus Christ to be our sacrifice in our place. God has set a high example. And it's funny, we all have, anybody who's had children or been around children knows this, what do kids love to do, especially little ones, when they see an adult doing something? If, if a little boy sees dad playing with the skill saw, what does the little boy want to do? He wants to play with the skill saw, right? <laughs> and, and, and if a little girl sees, sees mom, you know, working a, you know, hard in the garden or, or maybe helping dad with the skill saw because dad can't come straight to save his life, I don't want to discriminate against little girls. I think they can run skill saws too, right? My mom runs a chainsaw better than I ever could. But these little guys, they all want to imitate the adult, don't they? They want to imitate the parent. And we see this. My son waited like three years to imitate speaking, because Brianna never let him get a word in edgewise. Right? And once he did, boy, could he talk. Imitation is, is what children do. They see their parents do something, they say, I want to do that. I want to do it like mom or dad does, right? Or like their significant adult in their life does. And so we say, well, what are we supposed to imitate? Okay, God is loving, but what does that really look like? And because Paul said, therefore, we say, what's it therefore? We go back to Ephesians 4, verse 32. 
where Paul says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Right? So God said, here's the example, I forgive you. I forgive you absolutely and utterly. I forgive you of all you've ever done, all you're doing, and all you ever will do, because of Jesus Christ, my Son, that I sent for you, because I love you so much. I forgive you. Therefore, if you're going to start imitating me, if you're going to walk in love, you have to forgive one another. That's where it begins. Where it begins for us to imitate him is to forgive. Walking in love is a challenging thing. And the problem is today that our society has cheapened love. It's made it something that's just a word you say. Right? What's McDonald's current advertising slogan, you know? I'm loving it. As if fast food that makes you fat and sick is something we should love. Come on, it's good. It tastes good, but it's not good for us, right? We cannot afford to cheat in love. And so Paul takes the time in explaining how to walk in love and saying to imitate God. He takes the time to say, this is what you shouldn't do, and then warn you about a few other things as well. In verse 3 and 4, he says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. It's always interesting to me when God says, don't do something. Because if you look at it carefully, you see all he's trying to do is to protect something good that he created and to protect us. When he says things about avoiding sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness, he's just saying, look, I made stuff. It's not wrong to like stuff, but when you want other people's stuff, you've gone too far. We are created, frankly, friends, as sexual beings, male and female, he created them. We are designed for each other. That is a good thing, and yet, this whole world, this society tells us, it's good to just mess around with that, to play with it as if it doesn't matter, to have multiple whatever, and to keep going on and on. Paul says, look, don't cheapen love that way. God's love is too great. The example he calls us to is too high. The, the, the way we're supposed to imitate him is, is too important to cheapen it. <coughs> so what are we supposed to do instead of these things? We're supposed to be thankful in all things for what we have, for what we've received, and even, my friends, for what we've lost. <coughs> that is so difficult, isn't it? But to follow God's example, to imitate Him, is to love and to be thankful. And Paul warns us as he goes on that some will try to lead you astray. Look at it, verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. If there's one thing I'm certain of in this world today, if there's one thing I'm convinced of, it's that there, the society we live in, the culture we live in, is trying to say that good is bad and bad is good. The days are evil. You don't have to watch too many TV shows to discover that, do you? Everything that this world is trying to communicate today, especially in North America, is that, you know what, if it feels good, do it. Without regard to consequence or who it's going to affect or who it's going to hurt. Well, that's not walking in love, is it? And the scriptures are clear that we are supposed to walk in love. We're supposed to imitate God. There's always people who will try and lead us towards the darkness. But love is the characteristic that leads us towards walking in the light. In order to fight the darkness. Ben, can we have the next slide, please? Walk as light, Paul says. Look at verse 7. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I don't know why we don't understand this, but light and dark can't coexist. When I turn on the light, the darkness disappears. Right? Now, I might have to crawl under the bed to find some more darkness if I really want to find it. But in general, if you turn on the light, the darkness is gone. Right? When one happens, the other can't. Everybody's not sure of that. Just sometimes you can see a single light right across the Bay of Fundy. How many miles is that? About 30? Is that what I'm hearing? Think about that. 30 miles away, a single light might be in somebody's living room window, and you can see it because light cuts through darkness. 
and destroys it. Well, light is the darkness must have been introduced here. And the interesting thing is, Paul doesn't just say we belong to the light, God is light. Paul says we are light. And he calls us to try and discern, try to understand, try and figure out what is pleasing to God. The encouragement I find is that although sometimes we try and fail, because God is love and is a loving Father, He looks at us with love. He appreciates and honors even our failures when we're attempting to show love and live in the light. But you can't try and live in the darkness or ignore it, can you? Look at verse 11 and 14. He says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. What a reminder for us. We try so hard today to respect people's privacy, to stay out of other people's business, which is really funny because we're really good at talking about it, aren't we? I mean, how many of us have caught ourselves without even realizing it? talking about somebody else's issues, problems, or situation. And Scripture calls that gossip, right? But at the same time, what we should be doing is when we're talking about other believers and we hear about somebody that's hurting or somebody's in a bad situation or somebody's struggling with a problem, we are called to be light, to shine some light into that darkness, to speak truth with love so that's to win the back to the Lord. And we're so afraid to meddle, that we misunderstand our role. If I am light, if I'm not just a child of light, if I'm not just you know somebody who belongs to the Father of light, if I am actually light, then by definition, when I walk into a situation where there's darkness, what should happen? The darkness should diminish. It should be lessened. Right? Same is true for each of us. Each of us who have trusted Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, each of us that comes to this table based on that simple principle that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He died on the cross and rose from the dead, and we put our faith in Him. Each one of us is light in this dark world. And wherever you go, be it your workplace, your home, your family's home, your friend, neighbor's house, friend or neighbor's house, each of us is to bring that light with us. And it should shine so brightly that we can't cover it up. But we need to wake up. See, as Paul goes on, verse 14, he says, Anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We've got so complacent, so accepting of our culture. We talk about our favorite TV shows and how they make us laugh or how we enjoy the drama or whatever. And we ignore the things that should affect us. We see marriages imploding all around us. We see relationships exploding. We see people that cannot forgive and will not let, let grace uh, survive or live or thrive. And friends, we forget that if we are light, that is exactly what should never be allowed to happen. Even when it's most dark, I can see that light across the bay. And friends, this world desperately needs us to shine. To dare to be the ones that light up the place. That bring love and light. Now the only way we can do that, however, is if we not only walk in love and light, but if we have some wisdom, right? So Paul says, walk in wisdom. In verse 15, the next slide, please, Ben. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. That was 2,000 years ago. Have they gotten better since? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Walking in wisdom means starting with making the best use of our time, making choices about how we use our time, the way we spend our days. And we're not good at this. We, we generally spend our days in the same way day after day. We get in the rut, don't we? We get up in the morning, we eat you know, what we usually eat, we go to work or go, you know, start our day with what we usually start our day with, we, we, we get you know, ready for lunchtime and we do what we usually do. We're creatures of habit, aren't we? And we never stop to actually evaluate whether our habits are the best way. And this, this is, there's a real tension here, friends, because there's so many good things to do nowadays. I'm excited about our community here. St. Martin's is getting finally interested in fitness. 
We've got that fitness center going up there, and yesterday you may have seen the folks running up and down the thing doing what they call the 5K fun run. I think they have a warped idea of fun, but that's beside the point. Right? But, but it's exciting. It's good. It's good to take care of the body. It's good to be you know, healthier. It's good to eat healthier and, and exercise those things. Right? But Paul even says, what is better is to feed the Spirit. And if you are so busy working out that you don't have time to read the Scriptures or to spend time with God's people or to share your faith, then friends, you've got to make some different choices because you're supposed to do what's best, not just what's good. Many things are good, but frankly, we only have so many hours in a day. How many was it? Anybody here more than 24 hours in a day? And if you only have 24 hours in a day, you need to find time for God. You need to find time to be fed. You need to have time, find time to share your faith. You need to find time to rest. Absolutely. And friends, that means we probably need to make different choices in a world where statistically people are spending, what, six, seven hours a day watching some kind of media? We asked a question at our youth group a little while back. Remember, Kyla? We said, how many hours a day are you connecting to something electronic? Now, between cell phones and tablets and computers and TV and all the rest of it, we actually had one person that did the math, and because they were doing two things at once a lot of time, he was connected to, the, to, to technology 27 or 28 hours a day. Think about that. How much time does that person have for God? How much time does that person have for others? If there's always something in their ears or something pouring into them that they never have time to stop and think. We need to walk in wisdom, make the best use of our time because the days are evil. Make no mistake, we don't live in a good society today, friends. Not that it's all bad, there's some things that are good about it. We have universal health care, I'm pretty happy about that. We have, you know, much better roads than Brazil where my mother went and the, the potholes are so bad you actually have to ford rivers with your car. Yeah, we have some good things, yes, but the days are evil. People care less and less about one another and more and more about money and stuff. People care less and less about others who are hurt and they usually find ways to put, you know, our family, our, our parents, our grandparents, just put them away in a home because, you know what, it'd be too much trouble to actually take care of them myself. And I say that knowing, friends, that there's some here that are doing an amazing job taking care of their loved ones. And I want to affirm you, we don't take enough time to affirm the caregivers. There's a place for homes, there's a place for professional care, but it shouldn't be our first resort, and all too often it is. Because we're supposed to walk in love and might and in wisdom. We need to understand that the days are evil. And when we just put away our loved ones, when we don't visit them, when we don't tell them how much we care and listen to their stories and hear their wisdom, we are the ones who lose. We need to understand what God expects of us. We make some choices. When we read in verse 18, he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. He's saying, you have to choose what you're going to be filled with. You have to choose what you're going to put into you. Are you going to put spirits in you, or God's Spirit? What's it going to be? Is it going to be something that, that messes you up, or is it going to be something that connects you? These questions are ones we don't like to listen to. Then he tells us how to talk to one another. It's really quite encouraging to me. In a day and age when so many churches have been fighting over how they should worship, Paul addresses all the styles, really. He says, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. In other words, talk to each other the way we talk to God, with respect, with love, with honor. Put others first. Paul says... That's walking in wisdom. Making the best use of your time and choosing what you're filled with. Speaking to each other in an honorable way. And verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Friends, wisdom includes balance. Too much of anything is dangerous. Too much of anything can overwhelm us. And the last slide, please. Walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. It's a reality check for us, I think. 
Because all of us struggle to do these things. All of us wonder what it really looks like. And, and I want to suggest you should take a lesson from Elvis impersonators this morning. You know, if somebody wants to impersonate Elvis, they don't just think to themselves, I heard about this guy Elvis, I think I'm going to try to act and look like him, do they? Don't they, like, read up on his history and study pictures and movies and, and, and listen to his songs and try to understand and know everything they possibly could about Elvis, right? I mean, there's competitions for this where people try to be the best Elvis impersonator and, and they just spend their whole life trying to look like him, talk like him, walk him, you call him all that, you know, all that stuff, right? I can't do it, really. <laughs> Friends, if people will spend that much energy to look like Elvis, who, let's face it, was a pretty flawed individual, shouldn't we be willing to spend some time trying to know who our God is, what Jesus Christ, who was on this earth, actually lived like? In that old saying, what would Jesus do, is the beginning of an attempt to imitate God, isn't it? So I want to suggest that if you want to imitate your Heavenly Father this morning, if you want to be an imitator of God, then you should study the one you want to be like. You should read His Word. You should do what He did. You should practice what He practiced. And eventually people will see God in you if you do this. They will see the light shining through. Learn about Him. Through creation, through your experience, through Jesus Christ. And evaluate everything you learn through the Scriptures. He will not steer you wrong. Try to imitate God this morning. And you will become the person He intended you to be. The answer is actually turns out quite simple, and yet doing it is hard. Do what God did and does. Live like Jesus lived. Choose what He chose. Would you pray with me?